Okay. Um, so I'm Tiago is going to be pleased because I want to disagree a lot with some things the previous speaker said and agree with some others and cover some of in some sense the same territory. I'm a historian and philosopher of economics and um, that's given me two different agendas here. I'm really interested in statistics as good measurements of things and particularly good principled measurements of things and I'm also interested in the way um, that um, statistics are used, numbers are used to change things in the world and I want to talk about something that Summer was, uh, raised which is the um, Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals as examples of these two aspects of having good principled measurements at the same time as having measurements which might actually um, act as uh, devices to, ch to make the world better, not necessarily via official channels, but by other channels. Uh, which way is this going? Okay, so here's the old Millennium Development Goals, for those of you who might not have been familiar with them. Um, eight goals um, in these very simplistic pictures. Um, each goal has a number of targets to be met inside it, so there's 21 targets, and each target is measured by a number of indicators, so depending on which way you looked at it, there were 48 or 60 indicators. Possibly most people be more familiar with um, the Make Poverty History campaign and its kind of classic measure, which is a dollar a day, um, and maybe the other ones, the Human Development Index um, and the multiple, multi multi-dimensional poverty index, already too complicated, um, as measurements which um, were available to prompt some kind of action. And if there's a sort of development recipe there, uh, it's extraordinarily non-economic, actually. The economics is almost missing from this. Um, it's very much, if one thought it was an economic recipe, it's a kind of micro one to have good health and good education and so forth. But it's not um, a development recipe in the kind of economic sense. Um, this was replaced uh, um, with the Sustainable Development Goals uh, announced in September 2015, the UN's new program for getting the world to develop. And you can see that it's gone from um, uh, eight goals to 17, and each goal is measured by a number of targets. Or No, it's not measured by a number of targets. It has a number of targets to aim at within each goal, and each of those targets is going to be given a kind of measure of indicators to what are those targets being met by a number of indicators. So those are the numbers. And um, if there's a rough ratio of three to one, we're talking about more than 450. And I think the numbers, last time I looked, the number wasn't exactly set. It's a large number of uh, indicators in exactly the way that Samar was talking about. You generate uh, lots of indicators. And the big difference, I think, uh, here is the economy is in a sense back in, uh, in that there's some sense that there's some economic activity here which is um, going, going to be part of this development project. Uh, we've got more uh, environmental stuff in and we've got um, part of the modern agenda on good institutions. Um, so what's at stake in this measurement here, uh, this, this move from uh, the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals? Do more goals, more targets, and more indicators mean that they're just going to be spread much too thinly for action, which I think is at least one of the possibilities? Um, do such large, does such a large number of targets and indicators let every nation off the hook? Nobody's really responsible. Or does it let a thousand flowers bloom? I mean, what's the kind of political outcome of having that massive expansion? And does it encourage more bottom-up or more top-down kinds of actions compared to the old program? So, I'm sort of interested in the, in the benefits and dangers of such an expansion. And I suppose also as a historian, I'm kind of wondering, um, is it the case that ever in history there has been a development that happens across all these things all at once at the same time? That is, can you have the good life for everyone on all these dimensions uh, happening together? Which seems, uh, I've tried this out in my department, I'm in a department of economic history, and they they kind of laugh at the idea. So <laughs> I, I think there's a kind of real um, uh, ambition, utopian ambition there, uh, which uh, underlies all this. Okay, so if we're thinking about the measurement problem, all right, um, statistics for measuring. Um, there's too many indicators in some sense to judge easily success on the sustainable development goals, which is exactly the point that Summer was making. Um, 
One of the things that I think is good about them is it's a bit like poverty. Poverty and development have the same kind of properties. Um, it's pretty difficult to measure poverty or development, but there's a lot you can do in observing the bits which we think are associated with those two things. So one should think in a way of this as a kind of observation strategy rather than a measurement strategy, right? Because all of those indicators are little ind independent little measures of the observations that we need to make. <clears throat> uh, if measuring poverty or development creates many indicators to really get a grip on it, and I think that's uh, arguably the lesson of you know, 100 years of trying to measure poverty at least, um, it creates lots of indicators in different incommensurable units. Right? I mean, okay, you can play around with this and make them all percentages or something like that, but basically you're looking at different things and you're thinking about them as different things and you've got to think about you know, political rights, um, good institutions, uh, legal identity, um, CO2 emissions. All of these things are going to come at you in different units. Um, and if they're incommensurable, they're not going to be easy to aggregate into an overall index number. So those indicators don't make index numbers. And for me, an index number is a completely different thing than an indicator, because an index number is a principled measure. Right? There's a principle which tells you how to make these things commensurable and how to weight them, because you need to be able to weight them. If you thought about those, the old HDI and the MPI, well, we just make HDI a third of each one, and the MPI was you know, 10%. And there's no principle there that says um, legal identity, having a concrete floor, having running water, are, e are the same weight in, in your poverty, which I think is one of the things that one might think about with your five indicators. How do you put these together in any meaningful, principled way? So index numbers represent holes really well. The CPI, for instance, the um, MPI doesn't do such a bad job. But you can't unravel them from action. You know, the CPI is a principled measure. It's the consumer price index. It's a cog in lots of different uh, institutions we have, contracts for pensions and all sorts of things. But you can't unravel it. You know, you can't, the government can't act on the CPI. By acting on the CPI, they have to act on the bits. So it's, it's useful because it measures the aggregate, but it's not useful for acting on directly, <coughs> unless you have a completely monetarist theory about it. Um, <clears throat> indicators the opposite, they represent the bits really well, but for reasons I've suggested, you can't make very easily it principled measures out of a whole lot of different indicators, which are incommensurable and you don't know the weights. So both of these have um, some sense problems if you think about them as the whole big set or, or the small set. <clears throat> Um, I think there's a different set of considerations if we're thinking about statistics for changing the world, which is the public role of these SDG measurements. Uh, we've already uh, opened up the agenda that measurements are a social good, uh, very nicely from uh, Ed and also from Summer. Um, trusty statistics, and of course, sorry, from Diana. Uh, trusty statistics are really important. They depend on having a trusted bureaucracy, which is the things that Ed and Mike were talking about. We need a high investment in maintaining data. They need to be neutral, and they need to be open, all the points that we've already heard. And interestingly enough, this is recognized by the UN in the SDG. They take it to be almost part an indicator of SDG that a country has an independent statistical office and can produce independent good statistics which are freely available. That's one of the aims of development, is to produce that. I'm amazed that we are so late, uh, talking to your history, in producing this independent office. Um, if they're public, this is a tremendous advantage, because they may, it may create resistance from all sorts of top, bottom, and middle, but they also present, give this possibility of creating voice. Right? So each of these little indicators can gather a little agitpop group who tells their government, we demand this as part of our development. Right? We need demand legal identity. We demand no CO2 emissions. We demand this. So each of the indicators has the possibility to create an activist group uh, with voice around it. And I think that's part of some of trying to get your um, groups on board, is they need to be able to recognize that's a, a group that they want. So policy interventions uh, can be top down, or they can be bottom up. So civil society with stakeholder voices 
can gravitate to each of these individual uh, indicators, which is a possibility which I think you don't have if you have rather simple kinds of index numbers that don't necessarily produce the kind of activists that you want. That's certainly what happened in the early 20th century uh, after the Booth Poverty Project, which created lots of different aspects of poverty, each of which could be taken out and have a legal action on them to create old age pensions, to create wages board. So it's the fact that you had all these different measures or different indicators which enabled uh, legal activities or le legislative change to actually not create the welfare state as a massive project, but to, to create um, an action on each of the individual bits. So um, performing poverty numbers you know, the, the Millennium Development Goals versus the Sustainable Development Goals. I think it's a question of getting the right kind of measuring instrument, one which has some principles, uh, which acts at the right level of aggregation for different purposes. Thin definitions and aggregation up has and can have a huge rhetorical and mobilizing power. The dollar a day is exactly one of those. It's not a good measure of poverty, but it mobilizes massively. Um, at the bottom, the thick definitions and the disaggregation, dissembling down to the indicators, can give access to the causal knowledge which is about what development is associated with, because you can measure the bits. You can't measure the whole causal structure, but you can get at some of the really important elements of it. But it also gives a greater power, potential power and action sequence. And in between, you have these middle level things, and I think HDI and MPI look like they're index numbers because they are index numbers but they're kind of false because there's no good principle about the weighting but they allow some mobilizing power and some action possibilities okay so i've set out the kind of the two extremes and what what we've seen happen in history is actually these middle level stuff give you some of both and the simple stuff gives you mobilizing but the indicators might mobilize in a completely different way thank you <coughs>